Hey everybody, it's Robert coming to you with another adventure into history and on this video we're going to be investigating an ancient Native American sacred site hidden in these hills overlooking the Flint River in west central Georgia. And if I've ever said that we've been in the middle of nowhere before, well this is even further than that. There haven't been humans living in these hills for a very, very long time. But look at this view. So in addition to investigating the Native American sacred site up here, we're also going to do a little bit of exploring these hills, think about what life for the creeks must have been like up here, and just enjoy the amazing natural beauty that this doesn't even feel like Georgia. So buckle up, hop in, it's going to be a heck of a ride. So this mountaintop has actually been replanted in longleaf pines. Uh, longleaf pines were the tree that was historically here. When we see the old houses that we often investigate and we talk about them being built out of heart pine, it was these longleaf pine trees that were cut down to build these places. And adding to the otherworldly feel of this place, the newly planted longleaf pines have been recently burned off. So seeing these uh, mountainsides with these small longleaf pine trees growing on them and also having recent fire up here, it really, I can't even describe how it makes this place feel other than otherworldly. It doesn't feel like Georgia up here at all. Now longleaf pines are an extremely slow growing tree and they were almost harvested to extinction. Of course, much of the land was cleared for fields, trees were cut down for building houses, and with a longleaf pine taking many, many years to mature, they just were not replanted like we see loblolly and other pines replanted for the timber industry. So it's super cool to see that these hillsides have been replanted in what once grew here. Longleaf pine trees are also the anchor for a very unique habitat that is created around and underneath the longleaf pine tree. So with the loss of the longleaf pine trees, that habitat is almost non-existent in many parts of the state of Georgia now. And it also provides home for several endangered species, such as the gopher tortoise. And as we go through and look at these hills and, and we see the tree life that's growing here now, we still really have no idea how it would have looked during the time that the creek lived here or even how it looked when the first settlers got here in about 1825, 1826. None of these trees come anywhere near old growth. Uh, much of this area has been timbered for years and years and years, probably timbered for about the past hundred years. So it's interesting to try to imagine how these hills must have looked back then. All right, so after several miles of navigating these very rough roads that go through these hills here, we have uh, reached the site. Uh, now, local folklore tells that this is a creek sacred site and also the burial ground of a Cherokee medicine woman. So we're gonna take a look at the site and uh, see what we can determine. Now I am absolutely no authority on Native American sites. In fact, we often don't even get a chance to document that part of uh, history here because there's just not much visible anymore. And that's what makes this site so special, if it is indeed a creek site, because it's something that we can actually see. It is a direct connection back to them. And I always have a little bit of skepticism. I hate to say when somebody tells me about a Native American site, because so many times I've had people point out to me the uh, dry stacked rock tombs that we often see and call them quote unquote Indian graves when they are not. They're people uh, buried there of uh, European descent. And those stacked stone graves were actually a tradition that was brought over often from Scotland uh, over here, and that method of burial was simply not how the creek buried. But this site, I think, is uh, special. It is unique and has one 
really amazing feature that differentiates it from just a pile of rocks. Now, oftentimes when we explore old home sites, we will find piles of rock that look very similar to this in the woods. And that often comes from field stones that were cleared from fields as they were getting ready to uh, farm those fields. They would throw them into piles, then maybe come back and use those field stones later to build chimneys, to build rock walls, the graves we mentioned, and that sort of thing. But there's something very special about this site that takes it from just being a pile of rocks in the woods to making it unique and backed up by local folklore that this is a Creek sacred site. And it's gonna be hard to see on video, but I will point it out the best that I can. There is, I believe, about a 70-foot rock wall that goes in a circle all the way around this site. If you follow my finger, I'm pointing out the path of the rock wall. So, can you see me over there? The camera right now is outside of this circular rock wall that surrounds this place. And I'm going to walk along this rock wall, even though it's not very visible to you guys at home, hopefully you'll be able to see me as I go in a circle around this place to kind of accentuate where the wall is. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn here. And this wall is very visible for me. It's very low, but it's very evidently stacked in a circle around this site. And I just felt a few raindrops fall, and this is a place that we absolutely do not want to be if it starts pouring rain here. We will never get out. These roads will turn to absolute muck. So let's cross our fingers and hope it doesn't rain too hard. And I am still walking along the rock wall, which again is very evident, very, obviously placed here. This is not a natural formation. This was definitely done by man. And I talked earlier that we see many piles of field stone in farmer's fields. And at first sight, that wouldn't look any different than that. But they would definitely not have this low circular rock wall around them that makes it so unique. Of course, there is a dead tree that has fallen across the rock wall and in to the circle here so kind of that kind of messes up for us but i'm going to continue around until i circle back around to where the altar was okay over the dead tree and the rock wall continues all the way back over here to the altar, forming a full circle that surrounds this. So let's get a closer look at this and talk a little bit more about the altar site. So again, local folklore or local oral history records that this pile of stone was once the site of an altar uh, for the Creek people that lived nearby here. And we'll delve a little bit more into them living back here in a little bit. But this is also alleged to be the grave of a Cherokee medicine woman. So what first threw me off about that is we were actually deep in what is the Creek Nation. So when I first heard talk of a uh, Cherokee medicine woman's grave, I thought that didn't quite sound right, being that Again, we're in the Creek Nation, but the explanation actually makes a lot of sense. The Cherokee medicine woman that is reported to be buried here was apparently captured by the Creek from the Cherokee, but she was held in such high regard by the Cherokee that they actually buried her here under their altar. Now, what interests me about that is you can see that at the center of this rock pile, there is an indention right there. Now, I don't know what that could be from, but it's interesting to see 
that there's an indention there. I can't verify that that would definitely be her grave, but we have an indention. And we know all about indentions from looking at all of the other cemeteries that we often see. Now apparently that this altar was not originally just the pile of rocks that it is today. Uh, apparently this site has been heavily vandalized over the years. Uh, treasure hunters looking for artifacts have torn it apart and apparently dug into the grave as well. So that definitely gives a solid explanation as to why this site is such a mess except for the rock wall. And there is absolutely no shortage of rock up in these hills. In fact, one thing that I think is super interesting is most of the ground around here as we look into these hills is still covered in rocks, which tells me that this land was never really cultivated by European settlers here after 1826. Otherwise, it would be cleared more so than it is. It looks like the only really purpose that this hills ever served for those settlers was timber and it continued as timberland up until 30 or 40 years ago and that helps add to uh, the mystery of this site of all of these rocks that are obviously not naturally here but also taking into account that this does not appear to have been a farmer clearing his field here and piling rocks here i think that there was definitely something else going on here so i'm going to give you a better look at the rock wall we're going to walk it a little bit again and that way you can see it on camera now obviously this is a very low rock wall you can see the stacked rock it is at about two foot across and it circles follow my finger circles all the way around just like so so obviously this is not a natural occurrence here And it can actually be best seen right here. So it absolutely amazes me to be here and be able to see a site like this because there is not much creek history that is visible that's left here. I've gotten asked on my videos before um, about different creek sites and really we don't have any that are known. Most creek sites were destroyed after 1826 or what few things remain are so far back in private property that we would never be able to see them or find them. I do know of a couple of mounds that are around and also the fact that people who That was weird. So it's absolutely amazing to stand here at this site and know that local folklore says that this has been known about as a Creek sacred site since the 1820s. And if that's accurate, if this is known as a, a Creek sacred site since the 1820s, then that absolutely verifies what it is. Another interesting thing to think about is this area that we are here west of the Flint River, uh, but right on the river's edge was highly populated by the Creek Nation prior to 1825. Before 1825, the boundary of the United States and the Creek Nation was separated by the Flint River. After 1825, there was a treaty signed between the United States government and the Creek Nation that ceded the lands between the Flint River and the Chattahoochee River over to the United States government, and it became a part of the Georgia as we know it today. European settlers quickly flooded in, and many different farms, plantations, and towns were established after that. The 1825 treaty was effectively the sale of the lands between the Flint River and the Chattahoochee River from the Creek Nation to the United States government. The treaty demanded that all of the Creek people leave these lands and move across the Chattahoochee over into Alabama, which then became the Creek Nation up until the results of the Creek War of 1836. After the Creek War of 1836, the United States government obviously won that war, and the result was the Creek Trail of Tears, or the forcible removal of the Creek people from Alabama to out west.
So the close proximity of where we are now to the Flint River, and the Flint River again was the border between the Creek Nation and Georgia as it was settled by people of European descent, meant that this area was also a major trading hub between the Creek Nation and the what was Georgia then. But also the creek had already started clearing some of this land. The reason that the United States government wanted the land between the Flint River and the Chattahoochee River was that they saw how prosperous the creek were with cotton plantations between these two lands. Another interesting thing to note is that nearby in an area known as the Cove, the history books record that the Creek Nation had already cleared the upper part of the Cove and were growing corn in that area. And that is literally just a stone's throw from where we are today as the crow flies. So my point is, is that there were major creek villages very close to this site, and that backed up with local folklore saying since allegedly the 1820s that this was a creek sacred site, means that it probably was. And it's absolutely amazing to be able to document this history that so much of has been lost. And another interesting thing to note as I explore these hills is I don't see any old chimneys. I don't see any signs of farming happening here. All I see are rock covered hillsides, which would further add to the preservation of a site like this. Because if a farm had been established here, more than likely this site would have been destroyed and turned into a farmer's field. That doesn't seem to be the case in these hills. I don't see terracing. I don't see any of that. I just see rock. And pine trees. So while the Creek Nation did cede the land between the Flint River and the Chattahoochee River and effectively moved over to Alabama after the Treaty of 1825, that does not mean that every individual Creek person left. And we know that for fact. We hear stories of different people who were Creek who stayed here after the fact. In fact, there's a story of two Creek men that sold their wares in Tobleton, Georgia, not too terribly far from here that lived in a cave over on the Upson County side of the Flint River. And there's other stories of Creek families that hid out in caves and kept their identity secret up until even relatively modern times in fear that they would be removed out west. So as it starts to rain again, I've got another couple things to point out out here that I think are of extreme interest. Uh, again, I am absolutely not an authority on Native American sites. I want to document that history. Of course, this, this whole mission of mine has been to document this sort of history before it's lost. Again, oftentimes we're not able to visibly see anything left behind by the creek. Now, if this were a early uh, settlement grave site, I could tell you more about it, or even a burial ground of the enslaved, I could tell you more about it. Because if there's one thing that I definitely know how to identify its graves. And coming out here today, I discovered something else that definitely gave me pause. And that is this right here. Now, it may be hard for you to see at home, but this to me looks absolutely like a grave, like an indention. It is the right size, length, and shape. The Creek Sacred Site is right over there where you see the fallen tree and we are, what is that, maybe 40 feet away and we see this, what looks to be like a grave. So I want to do a little bit more investigation on this here, but I also want to uh, kind of illustrate uh, it because I know these indentions are very hard to see on camera. So we're going to use this stick here and I'm going to put one at that end. Hopefully you can see it. and the other at that end. So you can see the length of this indention and it's about that wide. Now we know that graves are often oriented east to west with the uh, head of the grave facing east. And we find that in Christian burials. So one thing is I wanted to check this orientation of this grave. I absolutely believe that this is a grave here. This is due east facing that way. And th this grave, if I lay, if I lay the phone down in it, you can see this is east and west. Let's grab the camera. 
Hopefully you'll be able to see the screen there pointing east that way. And it is absolutely in line with this. So this is a, actually a really interesting visible uh, discovery out here. I, it is, if this was in a known cemetery, I would say without a doubt, this is 100% a grave here. And at this point, uh, seeing that, uh, the indention, the size of the indention, and the uh, east-west burial, I absolutely believe that this is a grave. So one thing that we're definitely going to have to do is come back to this site and bring Dan the Historian with us and uh, get his thoughts on this. So stay tuned for that video. For now, we are going to leave the, uh, the Creek Sacred Site here and we're going to explore a little bit more of these hills just so you can see the natural beauty and the almost alien landscape here. So we're just a few hundred feet away from the alleged Creek site. And something else that I think is important to this story is this body of water here. Now bear in mind, we are on top of a mountain essentially, and I believe that this is a spring. And why that's important is a lot of Native American sites were often found uh, near bodies of water, whether it be a spring or a creek or a river like the Flint River. And this is a spring right here. It has not rained this amount in a very long time. So this is a natural spring. And it's very interesting to see that and gives more validity to that being a native site up on the hill. Now, as we walk through this body of clear water that looks like I could just take a sip of it right now, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna stick my hand in it. Oh, it is ice cold too. It is ice cold. So as we head up, there is another interesting site up on this hill. So one thing I want to point out real quick is I talked earlier about all of these hillsides being covered in rock. And this is a really good example. But the rocks are much bigger here, but all these hillsides are just absolutely covered in rock. But this up here was, again, folklore has it that this was a quarry used by the creek to gather rock to build such as the uh, sacred site that we just left. And I believe that this is just a natural collection of rocks. These don't appear to have been uh, thrown up here. Uh, they appear to just be a large rock outcropping. But another interesting site to see that is a few hundred feet away from the creek site. And so again, local folklore says that this is a, a creek a quarry uh, where they would gather rock from and, and I believe it's natural. I don't believe these could have been gathered and put here by the creek at some time but as we can see this whole mountainside is just covered with rock all around me up there covered with rock but nothing to the extreme of this that I've seen yet. And I saw some of these stones that look like they may have been broken away at one time. I just noticed some of the larger stones out here. And I wanted to take a quick look and just see if there were any that were immediately visible as being worked or broken up by man. But I don't see that. But you can see all the bedrock right there. So absolutely makes sense that uh, this would have been a quarry and provided easy access to stone for building the site we just left, which is just, uh, like I said, a few hundred feet away. Now I've got to head back to the truck for a minute because uh, there's someone, someone else that wants to check out that spring. So if there's one person that I absolutely could not deny access to this spring right here, It'd be Annie the Aussie Doodle.
we're really getting into some more rough roads here. The landscape out here is purely amazing. And again, I've said it a couple of times, but this does not feel like Georgia. And the funny thing is, the trees that have been planted here, these, these are exactly what Georgia used to be, these longleaf pine trees. Of course, it's nothing like what it was way back when because these trees are small and the trees that were the longleaf trees that were growing here at the time of settlement were you know, potentially hundreds of years old and of course as we do know in this area the creek had removed some area had cleared some area for cultivation but still to wonder what this must have looked like way back when certainly would not have had these these roads back then and I tell you what I really hope that we don't encounter a rainstorm up here because this truck is two-wheel drive and uh, we are we are far far in the middle of nowhere this is not a place that you want to find yourself stuck or with any kind of problems I don't even know if there's cell phone reception here But the views are definitely worth it. Normally I wouldn't come down into an area like this without four wheel drive. But we're in my old truck today, which is just two-wheel drive. But you know what they say about, you know, overlanding in a two-wheel drive vehicle is your tires matter. Your tires are the most important thing, especially in a two-wheel drive vehicle or any vehicle that you plan on getting into uh, potentially sticky situations with. So, you've got the right thing going on here and we're driving my old farm truck with uh, tires in the back that was just about worn out and I think close to 20 years old but they were really good tires at one time so that counts for something right so we're actually headed down to the Flint River now I don't know if uh, we'll be able to make it all the way now, apparently this was the site of a creek village down here at the uh, at the Flint River and knowing what we know about the area I have no doubts about that whatsoever and it is a beautiful beautiful area hopefully we can you know make it back up this hillside this is this is an area that is historically known to be impassable but the reward for the risk the reward for the risk is definitely going to be worth it i don't know of another place in this area that's as beautiful as what we're about to see all right, and here we behold the mighty Flint River. And this was once the dividing line between what was Georgia at the time, what was Georgia that was settled by uh, people of European descent and the Creek Nation. Over on that side is where all of the uh, European settlers were. And over on this side, was the Creek Nation.
And right where this creek pours into the Flint River is where I'm told that a very large creek village was established. So amazing history here, amazing history in these hills. And what I tell you, this view is definitely worth it. All right, so we climbed back up the hill, back on top of the hill overlooking the Flint. Again, just had to soak in this view up here one last time. And again, talk about the terrain. Mountainsides just absolutely covered in rock. Recently burned, fire is essential for longleaf pine habitat. We see the baby longleaf pines growing through here and then the wilderness that's beyond. This is nothing what it looked like when the early settlers first arrived. I'm sure that it didn't take long for this land to be timbered. Maybe farms were attempted here and it was found to be useless for farming. There's much better soil very close to here. Maybe people never really settled these hills. But it's amazing to see, and it's amazing to see it as it is returned to our native longleaf pines growing here. I will never see this in my lifetime. I will never see these longleaf pines fully matured. They take many, many years to fully mature. They're a very special tree. This whole, this whole hillside is special for many different reasons. The creek were heavily populated throughout here. The creek had large settlements throughout here and nearby here, and I'm sure that they treasured these hills. The Flint River is a beautiful place. And maybe some early settlers came and settled here and enjoyed the beauty? I certainly do. All right, well, we are getting ready to head out of these hills. The journey is ending for y'all at home, but I've still got a little ways to go. You can look down this road and see that the road seemingly goes on for miles off into the wilderness before we get back to modern day civilization. But finding a place like that is very rare these days. And it's definitely something to be enjoyed and it's something special. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And I will see you next time on another Adventure into History.